Okay, so I shall, as usual, start the recording and upload the agenda. Start recording. I'm nearly there, John. Sorry. Right. I've just got my fingers crossed that the longer you take, Adrian's going to turn up. <laughs> oh, we've got the transcript on. Let me turn that off because it doesn't do Scouse very well. <laughs> right. OK. Um, yeah. I'll be ready to go. Are you OK with the process, yeah. John? Yeah, fine. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, an unusual set of circumstances that Adrian was in a tribunal this morning and was probably overran and said he either might be joining late or possibly not at all. Um, and so it's false to me to uh, take the chair for this particular meeting. Um, this is a, a public meeting uh, and it is being recorded. Um, and so what a reminder is that um, if you could all remain on mute unless requested to speak, raise your hand to ask a question or put your video on and wave profusely um, and use the chat if you want to. Um, and then when there's a vote, we will decide on the methodology for voting, which should probably be using the chat. Is that right, sir? That's correct. Yeah. OK, so there are um, 10 items on the agenda tonight. Uh, there is any other business. Do we need to declare that now? Or are we going to just cover yeah, it when we get to it? Go ahead, James. Uh, apologies, Chair, couldn't come through then. Uh, yeah, one AOB is just in relation to a DFE consultation that was published last week that I'd like to pick up at the end. Well, Simone White, the DCS, who will be joining the meeting, she's just finishing another meeting will be updating schools form in relation to that. OK. Um, brilliant. Thank you for that, James. Uh, OK, then uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of November. Um, do everybody agree that these were accurate if we go through them page by page? If anybody has anything to say, please raise a hand uh, and we'll take it from there. So we have uh, page one. Which is Open it. Uh, page two, page three, four, and page five. No, oh. Sue. Yeah, sorry. Can I just, um, in relation to point 10, can we just have it noted, obviously, and it says it's resolved that um, we obviously discussed the school improvement and behaviour support reports, but we only actually received a report for um, school improvement. OK, have you got that, sir? So have you got that? That we'll make a note that. Uh, Sorry, I was on mute. James, was the did the report not cover both? Yeah, I, th I think at schools forum. I don't know if it's reflected in the minutes, but I did make it clear that it covered both D delegations for school improvement and behaviour support. If there's any specific questions that forum members want to ask in relation to that, I'm happy to pick that up now. It's OK, did you have a question, Sue, about that? Yeah, I think it was just um, obviously we're voting tonight on de-delegated budgets and it was just that it was the breakdown of spending of the behaviour support um, service last year and exactly just just really to look at that in more detail. I don't think we felt that that report was as detailed as the school improvement one. James? I don't have a report on it for today, uh, but I'm happy to take if there's any questions in relation to how that resource has been used. Is there any specific questions? Uh, Margaret? 
Yes, I think <coughs> we had a meeting earlier, and I think the issue we have is around the de-delegation of that budget. And really, we have no information on the impact of the spend over the past 12 months. We would be really interested to know how many schools and how many children have been supported and the impact of that support. And then there's also, um, in the last report on the behaviour support, there's talk about you bring back a report on the collaborative partnerships that were going on and the impact that they were having on schools and on reducing um, per permanent exclusions as well and how they were supporting children with SEMH. Um, and then again, looking at the post, which is a currently being covered on a temporary basis, and when we expect that to be going out to permanent advert. So I think they were the key points that we felt um, about the if we're going to have to vote on the de-delegation of that budget, is have we got enough information to make those decisions tonight? Thanks, Margaret. I think in relation to exclusions, I think that's actually picked up quite clearly in the, the report around alternative provision that shows the trend in the reduction of exclusions on Wirral. Um, on that specific point uh, in relation to the temporary position, I'm happy to clarify that, that we'll be going out to advert this half term in relation to a permanent appointment in that post. And that'll be advertised before the February half term. We're, we're just in the process of finalising that before it goes out to advert. So I'm happy to confirm that and happy to pick up any questions that may be in relation to that, but it, it will be going to external advert. Thank you. You happy with that, Margaret? Yes. OK, thank you for that. And Sue, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so that brought us to the end of uh, the uh, previous minutes. We're all happy with those. We can move on to the uh, set agenda, which brings us to uh, agenda item four, um, which is the report for the schools forum on the commissioned alternative education. Um, yeah, good everyone. Hi, John. Hi, yeah, John. Nice you to see right. you again. Absolutely. Um, hopefully, the report that you've received that was compiled beginning of December. Uh, is, is self-explanatory, but maybe a few little points to pick up. <clears throat> I mean, the first is it's hard to believe in these COVID times that it was a year ago that we were going through the tendering process for the commissioned provision for uh, young people who've been permanently excluded from school. That was completed. It was a bit of a feat of endurance, but it was completed um, towards the middle of last year and uh, it, it's great to see that uh, Progress Schools Limited were the successful tendering company uh, and are, are continuing to do a very very good job for us on the back of the test and trial package that we put together with them uh, for the previous two years. So we continue to work, work well, work effectively with them in providing a really good service. Um, moving on from that, I would say that uh, a, a shift over the last 12 months has been the development of more bespoke arrangements for young people who have been permanently excluded from school. Uh, and that's been extremely time consuming. So, for example, we've had two young people permanently excluded from grammar schools. Um, and that their needs are, are actually quite distinct and different from um, many of the other young people that we see that are, are permanently excluded. So we're having to work creatively and outside the box when coming up with um, the, the bespoke solutions that we're trying to. And, and great thanks actually to um, colleagues who have been willing to work with us in particular um, over the last 12 months um, Woodchurch High School, who have done um, some sterling work with some very, very challenging young people. Um, moving on from that, I'd like to say that our reintegration, our Key Stage 3 reintegration programme with Progress Schools is, is actually a, a, a flagship um, model of practice, of good practice. 
which is viewed very favourably and has been viewed very favourably around the country. Uh, the fact that we are having young people, fewer, thank God, but fewer young people um, permanently excluded at Key Stage 3, but where they are um, permanently excluded, there is a rapid intervention which is therapeutic in nature that helps to get them ready for reintegration back into mainstream school. And those reintegrations are sticking remarkably well. Most of our young people who are reintegrated back into mainstream um, managed to succeed um, very well indeed. The other good thing that is happening is that where young people are um, permanently excluded towards the end of key stage three, so late on in, in year nine, if it is deemed that a reintegration would not be successful or in the child's best interest, then we're managing to get them onto progress pathways swiftly afterwards. So, so there is seamless progression, whichever route a young person finds themselves on. Um, as noted previously, we're getting good outcomes for young people who've been permanently excluded. Those tend to be qualifications in, in English and maths, mainly functional skills, but also a range of vocational qualifications. Um, one concern that has arisen this year has been um, a very small number of permanent exclusions from the special school sector. Um, now, progress schools, let's be very clear, um, they are inspected as independent schools, so they are an independent school, but they do not have the level of expertise required to deal um, <coughs> with young people who've got um, quite complex special educational needs. And um, I think that that's something really that we need to just flag up and be very aware of as we move forward. Um, I would want to say, uh, and James is actually referred to it, you'll see on the table that we have got a downward, a definite downward trend as far as permanent exclusions are concerned. And actually, it's been a downward trend. I've just used the last three years. But if you look over the last five or six years, um, you know, we've gone down from virtually 70 young people down to low 20s. And, and you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, our colleagues secondary and primary for the vast array of strategies which they are using to try to prevent young people from being permanently excluded. Um, and that obviously does include um, really sensible and prudent use of alternative provision as a way of developing, um, as I say, other, other strategies which help young people to be successful. Um, in terms of uh, the non-local authority commissioned alternative education, so the schools commissioned alternative education, I think um, really the, the key things that I'd want to pick up there, um, the first is that we've got a new registered provider due to open in Hoylake. Uh, it's, it is the last time I'd heard from them, they're due to be opening towards the end of next month. And that's a company called Transforming Lives for Good. Uh, again, like Progress Schools, they've got bases up and down the country. Their, their main headquarters is actually up in Bradford. They work on the same model that really all of our alternative education providers use, which is around therapeutic, heavily therapeutic um, input to try to get young people re-engaged back into school. So they're starting a very small base in Hoylake. Um, their top numbers, I believe, from February will be six. So only very small. Um, and then hoping over the next 12 to 24 months to build that up to, to double to, to 12. Um, I think a, a, an interesting take with Transforming Lives for Good is that they work very closely with the church and the church um, has volunteers that will work with parents to, to support on good parenting processes um, and, and to make sure that there is a, a, a very rounded and holistic approach to young people who might be finding school particularly diff difficult. Um, we've had a, a pilot with RAP this year around primary alternative education. I think the only thing that I'd want to say this afternoon in regard to primary alternative education is that it's, it's an interesting and new concept. 
and that we are still um, grappling with the um, challenges of how we should use alternative education with the primary sector. Um, and, you know, that, that, that I'll leave that question sort of hanging because I do believe that that is something that, that requires an awful lot more investigation. But there is no doubt that when I've spoken to prime, uh, secondary colleagues, What's happened is where there's been some intensive work with year sixes in preparation for enhanced transition arrangements to secondary school, those young people seem to have been pretty successful, actually. In fact, I met one at, uh, at Woodchurch High School today, and he's, he's an interesting character, but, you know, that they're, they're making it work. So, you know, all again, all credit to uh, primary and secondary colleagues for the work that's going into that. And the last one really for me to, to pick up is the important development of links with other further education colleges to make sure that we continue to develop the range, the breadth and uh, quality of alternative education ready for young people to progress from key stage four into key stage five. Thank you, Jan. Um, have we got any questions? None whatsoever. That's good Wonderful. Time. That's what I like to hear. Silence. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Sorry, John, go ahead. Uh, just a question around, um, obviously, we've been in a very tricky situation with COVID. Is there any anticipation that there are going to be children with additional difficulties because of the isolation that the pandemic and what are the plans um, for the future for that? I would have to say that, first of all, again, speaking to particularly speaking to secondary colleagues, there is no doubt that there has been an impact in regard to COVID. I think the important thing where where we're concerned is that, number one, schools are obviously doing many of the right things in terms of their their therapeutic strategies um, and, a, and a, a real awareness of um, emotional literacy in regards to the curriculum because that is showing with the reduced numbers of permanent exclusions. So that's that's the first thing. I think schools are being very mindful of, of that situation. Um, I think that schools are also using alternative education prudently in regard to where young people do need some respite and time out um, for, for additional help. I think it's it's really around every individual school to do what it needs to do in regard to meeting the needs of their young people. Thank you, Jim. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm. I'm. The the one thing I'm just a bit concerned about is obviously it's still early days in terms of the the, the, the recovery, but, but and uh, it's just about future. Obviously, we want schools to be like you say, the, the ones do it, do, doing the work. It was just in case it had been anticipated. If, and if, if it's a, a question that we don't need to ask, then then I'm happy. But like um, it was just a, 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 a query and a worry in terms of what I think might what might potentially be coming. It's it, it, it's worth me saying, John, that I think we're we're managing with the numbers that we have at the moment. Fair point. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I want to say thank you for that excellent report. I think it's a real positive uh, picture of what's happening on Wirral with the reduction in uh, exclusions and the, the positive outcomes for those students who have um, chosen to go through that particular route or are going through that particular route. And the options that are available through um, negotiations from your team is, is really good. And I, I really enjoyed reading that report. I gave a quite a positive outcome on what is a, a negative aspect of education. So thank you, John. Thanks, John. OK, take care. Thanks take for your time care. this afternoon. OK, John, if you've uh, got no more questions, John, you can put your hand down if you wouldn't mind. Um, that moves on to agenda item five, which is to do with energy purchasing for schools. And to talk on this, I think it's Jacob. Is that correct? Oh, no, sorry, it's uh, Andrew Snow. Andrew Snow. Sorry, I got him in the wrong order. <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> 
No, no problem. I, I, I do apologise in advance because the message um, I have to bring you is not as positive as the previous one. The report provides a brief update on the procurement of electricity and natural gas on behalf of sc schools and suggests budget changes for the 2022-23 financial year. Uh, the content is only applicable to accounts that are part of the Crown Commercial Service Framework Agreement. Um, now, you will all be aware that since late 2021, uh, energy costs have risen with alarming peaks. Um, there have been peaks over 600% that have been um, uh, reported for gas in particular. Uh, the volatility has been widely reported in the press and will affect all schools and council buildings. Even the domestic sector, which has a degree of protection with, it, with the energy cap, will see significant cost increases from 1st of April 2022. And uh, some commentators from the industry have stated that they expect these high levels to continue for uh, a couple of years. Uh, there are several reasons for this. The UK is a net importer of electricity and gas, which means that the country is very susceptible to international market movements. Uh, some of the contributing factors, are, and th this list is not exhaustive, is competition for liquefied natural gas from the Far East to fuel their COVID recovery. Concern over gas supplied from uh, Siberia and the tensions that are over the Ukraine, uh, which are which unfortunately continue to grow. Uh, on the electricity side, we've got a reduced supply from the French nuclear base due to the discovery of uh, reactor cracks, which is affecting some, which has reduced their output uh, by about ten percent. Uh, and uh, also, we've had one of the main interconnectors with France failed in uh, late 2021. I think it was at the beginning of October. And reinstatement is uh, unlikely to happen before March 2022. And this has Im uh, reduced our import capacity. Um, the following changes to the expenditure are suggested as precautionary provisions to take account of the increased prices for the next financial year. The uh, suggestions are made, made using the worst case scenarios that we've received from um, Crown Commercial Services uh, and due to uncertainties because of ongoing market volatility. To, so here comes the bad news. Um, we're suggesting an increase in provision for natural gas supplied by total of 194%, uh, which is three times the current provision. On electricity, it's not quite so bad, but the electricity supplied by EDF, uh, we're suggesting uh, uh, an increase of 70%, which is 1.7 times the current provision. Um, and I'm very sorry to have to uh, give these figures to you, but um, the, the, this, these are a consequence of the, the, the market movements. Uh, now, in, on the plus side, last year, you may remember that uh, following the Council's declaration of a climate emergency, uh, we uh, uh, decided to uh, 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 purchase uh, green electricity from our supplier, which is EDF, uh, and that cost was uh, recycled to schools di directly through journal transfers. Uh, this will continue for the 2022-23 financial year. Um, and the green electricity is backed by renewable energy guarantees of origin and the additional cost is funded by the climate emergency budget. Um, now, I, I, I know that's 
an awful lot to take in. I have been hearing uh, concerns over uh, the the increased provision that will be necessary. Uh, but when I I did a, an analysis of uh, market prices against uh, prevailing market prices in comparison to what the Crown Commercial Service is was recommending as the worst case. And the market prices for summer 2022 and winter 2022 on the forward markets were considerably more than the unit prices achieved by uh, CCS. So it it give as I've always said, uh, the the way we purchase our energy gives us a degree of protection, but it can't insulate us totally from from the market movements. Um, any any uh, questions, comments? Anybody have Stumbling. any questions? I had, can I just ask, is that you've presented a worst case scenario? Would you yeah. be prepared to go on record to say your optimal estimates of most likely outcome? Uh, it, 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 I, I think the, 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 the most important thing is to, uh, I, I can't say what's going to happen with the prices, but I, the, the, the majority of our energy has been purchased. Uh, and uh, I, I think it'll be uh, about 5% below what I'm suggesting, but I think it was just sensible to uh, take the, 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 the worst case scenario. Uh, I, think, I, th I think it's the, the, the or it, what we're looking at is an order of magnitude. Um, I've, I've had to uh, flag this up obviously to to the council the council uh, uh finances that i think it's been included as part of the uh, risk register um and there's there's very little i, I mean I'd, I'd love to be able to go and sort the some of the underlying problems but it, it's just beyond our 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 um our remit and and capabilities to do do so Okay. Any further questions before we thank Andrew? Okay. Um, thank you, Andrew, for, for your good news on oh, so I, I apologise for it. I, I, I wish I was giving you something different, but the numbers are the numbers. I think we're all very aware with uh, domestic energy uh, prices yeah. and the way things are going that uh, this was going to be inevitable. Grateful we have some protection, but uh, we'll yeah. have to watch this I mean, very closely. It, it, it is possible that the government may intervene, but that, that's something that uh, <laughs> obviously I've got no idea whether that will happen if it happens. But Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll wait and see what happens and hopefully um, we, we can do better than the um, worst case predictions, but we shall wait yeah. and see. But thank you for that. It's a pleasure. Oh. Oh, well. okay. um, that was the energy update. It moves us on to item six on our agenda, which is the report uh, on the school's budget and the three year forecast. Um, is that you, Christine? It is indeed. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, I uh, first acknowledge that the budget report is obviously in forecast is obviously a very detailed report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of highlight the main issues um, and items of note and then give forum members an opportunity to come back and ask any questions or for any further confirmation they may need. So if I could just ask you just to move down to paragraph 3.1, because I think the table in paragraph 3.1 is sort of the area where it will give me the opportunity to explain sort of most of the changes and the basis for the budget and the three year forecast. Just to say that the, the budget and forecast have been prepared on a gross position. So that means it actually includes academies as well as all of our um, maintained schools. Um, the, the budget that's been prepared for 22-23 will be considered by the Policy and Resources Committee at the February meeting. 
they won't be considering formally the forecasts, but they're included in the report for information. So just looking at that table in 3.1, um, the gross budget is just is 316.2 million. As I say, that's the gross position. Um, and just that the main things to look at is on the schools block, which we included, the budget and the forecast for the schools block, that's based on the actual grant funding that we're actually going to get for 22-23 and forecast grant funding for future years. And the budget assumes that all of that is going to be um, distributed to schools. There's no top slicing in there whatsoever. It's all being distributed to schools. The basis for the schools budget, particularly going forward this, so the budget is based on the census, uh, for the October 21 census and going forward is making some assumptions about pupil numbers and what we're seeing in those forecast years is as our primary school numbers are still continuing to fall to the forecast 25-26 our secondary school numbers are increasing and it's not till we get to the end of that forecast and um, the third year forecast that we then see that actually stagnating then at, at the levels will be at 25-26. The central schools block, most of the funding in there is actually funding from ESFA for central schools funding, but it also includes the 1.6 million contribution that the council make for picking up an element of the PFI um, affordability gap. On the central schools block, there are two elements of that central schools block. There's the ongoing functions that we're funding for, and that sees just a very small increase year on year. But there's also an historic element in there and the element of that funding is reducing over time because that's funding as we say some historic um elements that the esfa allowed to be funded out of the central services block but esfa make an assumption that those services are being unwound over time so for that particular element of that funding block there is a 20 percent reduction in funding going forward there is something that we do need schools forum to give feedback and to vote on regarding the central services block, but I'll come on to that later in this report. Just moving on then to the high needs block. The high needs block is based on our funding that's been allocated to us for 22-23, but also take into account some additional costs. So in particular, this is where the, actually the forecast years is particularly important for the high needs block. Because what we've done is we've looked at our current volume and capacity and sort of looked at what we've and planned at what we need, capacity we need going forward. And this is where it's been really important to include the forecast to get that visibility of the impact going forward on our plans for 22-23. So what we've looked at for 22-23 in the forecast going forward is taking sort of real um, taking into account the high needs strategy. So we'll look at what we've looked at there is the impact of the volume and the complexity on those special school pupils, particularly those transitioning from primary to secondary. We've also looked at existing demand and taken a view of where we expect that to continue to 22-23 in the forecast years. Also looking at trying to maximise and increase our mainstream based provision. And with that eye on looking at our increased provision in the special schools and our mainstream based provision, what we're looking at in the forecasting years is to be able to reduce our reliance on the independent sector and also look at that those other funding streams we have, particularly on the EHCP plans, but also our um, the pupil funding arrangements where going forward into the forecast, particularly the latter two forecasts, we want to reduce our reliance on those arrangements. So what that does need for our high needs block, there is some significant growth in the high needs block. Moving on to the early years, the early years again is really just taking into account what we think our forecast take up is of our two year old provision and three and four year old provision for 22, 23 and going through into the forecast years. One thing I will point out is you'll probably be aware that in December ESFA announced some additional funding, some additional supplementary funding for our schools. The additional supplementary funding for Wirral is around 7 million. This budget does not include that supplementary funding. A, because ESFA have not yet fully confirmed how that's going to be allocated. And we think that that's going to be allocated as 
separate funding rather than being part of the DSG schools funding. Similarly, there's some supplementary funding for high needs, which for Wirral for 22-23 is 1.9 million, but that has been included in this budget and the assumption of full allocation of that funding. And it is just one year funding for 22-23. And we've included it in the budget because part of it has been identified as, as our growth for 22-23 and part is yet unallocated We've made an assumption it will be fully allocated um, and it will be included as an additional allocation within that high needs block. On the basis of the budget we've set for 22-23 and that forecast position, you can see just that bottom line where we've got the contribution to or from reserves. What's identified that for 22-23 and 23-24, and this is all down to high needs, that the demand and the provision that we want to deliver, the cost of that will exceed our funding. So in 22-23, we exceed funding by 290K. And in 23-24, we exceed funding by 200K. But moving into the forecast years, that's when we start to see an improvement because that's when we can start to reduce our reliance on the independent sector and the pupil funding arrangements. So if I could just ask you to skip forward to paragraph eight, because I think it's useful then to see the impact of that on our cumulative DSG reserve. Sorry, so lot to jump through. <laughs> Thank you. So we can see there the impact of that on our reduction in reserves. What we're forecasting at the moment for our current financial year 21-22 is that by the end of the financial year, our cumulative deficit for the DSG reserve will be a deficit of almost 1.2 million. And because we're now sort of uh, what we've identified for the budget year is that we're going to increase that deficit by a further 290k. So that will bring the total deficit up to a forecast of 2.2 million. And you can see for 23-24, that is, position is worsened again by another 200k. But when we get to 22-24 and 25-26, that starts to improve because what we're starting to see is some in-year surpluses. And what we're expecting at the moment is by the time we get, to, if we jump forward another year to 26-27, we're hoping by that year that the cumulative DFG, DSG reserve will be in surplus. As I said, there's a lot of assumptions um, have been made in sort of the budget in the forecast year, looking at to get that to that position, but it is the best information we have at this moment in time. If I could just ask you, Sue, just to move forward onto Appendix 1, because particularly for the budget year for 22-23, there's significant growth in this year. So the growth between our current financial year and 22-23 is 14.7 million. Of that 14.7 million, about 7.5 million is relates to our primary and secondary schools. And most of that growth is around the changes in the funding formula for between 22, 22, 21, 22, sorry, 22, 23. In terms of pupil numbers, there's been a net change of just 12 pupils. But that has still identified growth of almost 600k because it's actually about just over 200 growth in secondary school pupils and a reduction of just over 200 in primary school pupils. So it does have quite a significant financial impact because the um, funding per pupil is higher for secondary school pupils than it is for primary school pupils. We can then see we've got some quite significant growth in the high needs and that's because what we're doing is we're increasing now proposing to increase our special school places. Those places at the moment are not allocated. They're in there. Most of them are not allocated. They're in there as as growth, knowing that we we need to increase our provision. But that decision hasn't hasn't been made yet exactly where that increase in provision will be. And it's normal practice for us to come back to schools forum to identify identify when we actually want to allocate those places to schools. We're also proposing increase in our SEM based places and also our FE and sixth form provision. Just moving down to the early years, you can see that's showing a bit of a reduction of almost one and a half million. And that's not because we're taking funding out of early years. It's because that really is the impact of where over the last um, year we have seen a reduction 
in um, in a reduction in two year olds from three and four year olds. And a lot of that really is is allied to the general reduction in the in the birth rate across Wirral. But what we are seeing in our forecast years, we're expecting that to actually tail off and as then to start seeing an increase in two year olds and three and four year old provision going forward. Moving on to our central schools costs, a, a very small change in central schools costs, but I do need to come back to that. And then finally moving down to our high needs pupils, again, some significant growth in our units of resource. But again, in our forecast years, that does start to reduce. Some other areas of growth are in personal budgets, inclusive practice and interim education, where that's kind of new provision, where what we've actually identified is, is the demand that we've had around some particularly complex arrangements that we do need to make provision for. Increasing top ups, that increasing top ups is allied to the increase in places where there will be an increase in top ups to go along with those places. In and in 22-23, an increase in our independent provision, but that really just I, it, it reflects the demand we're having in 21-22, where we are forecasting overspend on the current budget. But in the forecast years, we're expecting our reliance on that will actually start to reduce. If I can just go back now, sorry to um, Sue, to um, paragraph section 6.3, if I can just talk very quickly about the central schools provision. Because as we're saying, in that central schools provision, there are two elements in there. There's the ongoing element of the funding, which funds things like our schools admission, licenses and subscriptions. And that at the moment we're forecasting uh, just a small increase, mainly in line with where we have staff costs in there, like school admissions to take account of potential inflation and the increase in the NI rate. But the other element of that, which is the historic functions, that element of the funding has reduced by 20 percent and the SFA plan for that to reduce by 20 percent on an ongoing basis. So they are contributions to um, services that the council do provide and we are planning to unwind those costs or to change the way we actually provide those services going forward so although the funding has reduced by 20 percent if you wouldn't mind moving down soon now just to the next table thank you so although the reducing the funding's reduced by 20 percent because we have identified spare funding capacity within the ongoing elements of that without uh, any other demand being identified. What we have identified that what we would like to propose is that we um, use some of that spare capacity of funding so that the reduction for the, con for the contributions to combined budgets is only 10% rather than 20%. Because I say, although we are unwinding that and reducing our reliance on that, that unwinding is just taking a little bit longer than the rate of reduction in funding. So it's something that when we come to the recommendations, we will be asking schools for and to vote on. If I can then just very quickly just go to Appendix 2, sorry. Sorry, I bet you get a bit dizzy, Sue, jumping up and down this report. And I won't go through this in detail, and hopefully members have had an opportunity to look at this, but Appendix 2 is sort of the, the more detailed analysis of the budget and the forecast going forward. And that does just highlight when we're looking at things like um, special school provision, SEM basis and sixth form. We can see that increasing over the forecast years. If you wouldn't mind just scrolling down a bit more so, just to the element where we've got the high needs pupils. And in the high needs pupils, we can see in the forecast years where we're starting to bring down the forecast for the independent schools and also on the top ups, which is the units of resource specifically for our pupil funding arrangements, where we're trying to reduce that reliance to make more provision and to make more use of our special schools provision and our basis and FE provision. So that's kind of as much detail I was hoping to identify until we go on to recommendations. So just happy now to take any questions or comments from forum members. Thank you, Christine. Very exhaustive report and very, very much appreciated. Do we have any questions from any of the forum members? There we go, John. 
Hi, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just a question about obviously that's the overall schools budget. Is it? Is is it? And maybe I've missed this. Has it been broken down into primary, secondary? It has in the table on appendix, um, appendix two. Yes, we have broken it down into primary and secondary. Thank you. Are there any implications there that you can see? Uh, no, not at the moment. I mean, the the 22-23 budget, the, that split between primary and secondary, that very much is based on the um, on the, the the census numbers which have come through. But of course, once we actually complete the authority pro forma tool, which is the detailed calculation of schools budgets, that split might change. At the minute, it's purely been based on the census numbers, but the actual detailed allocation to primary and secondary will be purely will be based on the national funding formula, where it is obviously more detailed. The forecast going forward, that really is sort of a little bit of a finger in the air, should I say, in terms of trying to take a view on how we think pupil numbers will go for, will be going forward. But again, once we get to those years, the actual allocation to primary and secondary will be based on the detail of the national funding formula. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. OK, any other questions? No. Uh, thank you for the report. It's it's good to look forward and see that um, there is some light at the end of the tunnel uh, and that things are going to get slightly better, although we have to wait and see how other impacts, uh, other things impact on on this. The recommendations, they are uh, something that perhaps you might want to talk us through as to all the aspects of the recommendations. I take it we, we take them as they are as 10, yeah. 1, 10, 2 and 10, 3. Or yeah. is there anything further you want to add? Uh, no, just but just to add on 10.1, when we actually uh, present the budget, so the, the school's budget will be included with the wider council budget when it goes to the policy resources committee in February for them to consider. But any views that schools forum want policy and resources committee to take note of then i will take those back and they will be included in the budget report that gets presented to policy and resources committee so it's just just so very, you know so if there is any strong views that forum members have we're happy to take those back to policy and resources committee okay thank you for that assuming not because i think they would have come out in the questions yeah. i think 10.2 is is the area that we do need schools forum approval on and that is the um, the funding those contributions to the combined budgets. And if we just want a bit more, and particularly the fact that what we're saying is that although the background funding is reducing by 20%, we would want to make those contributions, proposing that those contributions um, reflect just a 10% reduction in funding because there is capacity in the central services block for us to do that for 22-23. I don't know whether forum if, if if we want to consider those as a block, uh, whether it's worth us just going back to that um, paragraph section two six point three, where there's just a bit more detailed table. Happy to sort of take forum's views on these, whether they want to, and um, probably we need to go to a vote on this, whether they want to vote on mass for all of those services which form part of those combined budgets, or if they wanted to do them on a one by one basis. The easiest thing is to do them on mass. Has anybody got any objection to that? Take it that's a no. No. Um, so the proposal is that in accordance with the ESFA guidelines, the forum approves the reduced contributions to the combined budgets of 0.631 million in 2022-23 20, for school improvement, local safeguarding children's board, school intervention, PFI support, PFI CLC, looked after children, education services, business rates and governors forum. We will take votes via the chat. All those in favour say yes. Just give the lag within the system to allow everybody to type yes to, and to get their answers in or to type or to wait uh, if they're going to type anything else. Uh, all those uh, 
not in favour of that if they would like to type no. And any abstentions just type abstain. And Sue, have you managed to tot all that up to see whether or not all those who can vote have voted? We've only had yes, we've only had yes votes um, and that's 16 yes. So that's uh, agreed. OK, there's, there's no no votes or no abstentions. Brilliant. Thank you, Christine, for your report. Um, I think there's the final recommendation is just confirmation, just to advise forum that, it, that the budget yep. proposals will be taken forward to policy and commercial. Policy and Resources Committee on the 15th of February. Yeah, 10 1 and 10 3 are. Yeah. Yeah, just matters of fact. Yeah. Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, um, you. you can rest easily now as we move on to the de delegation services. Item 7. Um, this is Jacob. This was Jacob, yeah. Sorry, I tried to bring you in a bit early, but now is your time to shine. And you're on mute. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jakob Allen and um, I work in the Children and Schools Insight team and uh, I'm Principal Information Officer. Um, I'd like to present this year's uh, de delegation uh, schools budget report. Um, I'm just going to go through the percentage changes um, mainly on this because obviously we've been through a lot of detail with Christine uh, there. Um, the, uh, the budget for the de-delegation is actually split, if you're not aware, into seven parts for primary and five parts for secondary schools. Um, contingency uh, covers exceptional costs that we would not expect individual governing bodies um, to cover. Compared to 2021 for primary schools, the contingency rate has remained at a level of £1.13 per pupil. The contingency rate also remained unchanged for secondary schools at £2.15 per person. Um, the special staff costs, um, this uh, is split for purposes of the forum in maternity, paternity and trade union. So you can see the, how, it's, how it's divided up there. This is compared to 2021, the rates have increased to take account of higher maternity paternity costs. Um, most of the, the the proportion is for maternity leave. The, the total special staff rates are £31.11 for primaries and uh, in, in total. Um, that is £27.51 for maternity and £3.60 for trade unions. And secondary total is 38 3 and £3. That's 34.43 for maternity, paternity, and once again, £3.60 for trade unions. This is to cover for maternity and paternity and trade union costs for all staff, teaching and non-teaching. Um, moving on to the library services. Um, this, uh, this service is for primary schools for the provision of learning resources, including artefacts, posters, DVDs, as well as books. This year, the per pupil rate will remain unchanged at £8.78 after last year's rise. Um, insurance, this again is, is covered by uh, primary schools for liability insurance for uh, aided schools and the rate remains unchanged uh, this year at £1.19 uh, per, per pupil. Uh, moving on to behaviour support. Um, this is allocated to teams that work with primary, secondary and special schools across Wirral. Um, for primary, the, the behaviour support will be funded based on £17.35 per SEN support pupil. Um, not not on the uh, the roll numbers on roll. Um, similarly, for secondary schools, behaviour support will be funded based on twenty nine pounds four pence uh, for secondary SEN pupils. Uh, moving on to school improvements, this replaced the uh, education service grant in twenty seventeen, 
and supports the general improvement of schools and the rate remain remains sorry the rates <laughs> remain unchanged um, the former education services costs uh, this fund is is for maintained schools and includes special primary and secondary schools it covers costs associated with landlord responsibilities early retirement and other statutory costs related to finance lms and internal audit the rate remains unchanged compared to 2021. Um, and that's the end of my report. Brilliant. Short and succinct as ever. Thank you. <laughs> any questions from any forum members? No. Cool. Well, thank you for that. We have a, a list of recommendations, some of which uh, select members can vote for. Um, Sue will uh, guide us by the hand through this procedure and make sure that only those who can vote will vote. And uh, I think Simon has a special role being the only secondary head teacher representative. Um, so he'll be doing a lot of voting on his own. Um, but other than that, Sue, if you could take the lead on this and guide us through the, uh, the voting on these recommendations. OK, I'm just going to go to the list that we've got attached because uh, I think that makes life easier if your name's on the list. So the primary representatives can vote for the primary D delegation and the secondary representative, which is Simon, can vote on the uh, um, the secondaries. And then for the E, the special previous ESG grant, um, the the special schools, uh, which is Margaret and John, get to vote on that as well. So um, I'm aware that we do have um, a number of um, people who haven't who who gave apologies quite late on, which was Charlotte, Julie, and Tony. But I think everybody else is here. And the to be confirmed is Hazel, Hazel Beamish from Haygarth primary um so just so that we know who's who can vote so it's andy sue ralph john mcdonald emma johnson hazel thompson um it would be charlotte roy wood uh can also vote for the primaries so if we go back up to the um the list we normally vote for these on an individual basis um so um when we are voting when you put your yes or no in the box for contingency um, if you are happy to de delegate contingency if you can type in a before you put your yes no or abstention in that would be really helpful so for the primaries if we'd like to do contingency first Sorry, Sue, can specials vote on the contingency? No, the the special schools um, don't have by uh, don't have de delegation in the same way as the um, as the oh, really? primaries and secondary schools. They have what's called um, buyback, and right, that's, that's dealt that's with fine. separately. And you can make your own separate decisions. Each school can make their own decisions on them. Um, and I normally. I'll make sure that the information gets out to you um, as soon as, as soon as we've got the information so that you can you can do that independently, but it's not done through schools forum. Thanks, Sue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got two, three, four, five, six. six. Uh, yeah. Yes. Excellent. So that was that was for contingency. So for those of you who are who um those again, um if you are happy to agree agree to de-delegate special staff costs including trade union time so that's maternity and paternity as well if you can type in b and then yes no or okay six yeses excellent um so c if you're happy to de-delegate the library service which is the core service they do have a separate service you can buy into so it's the core service again for primaries that's six, six isn't it? excellent 
Um, the voluntary aided uh, insurance, if you can type in D. Six yeses for D. Um, e for school improvement. Yep, that's six yeses for E. And F for behaviour support. So far, I've got three yeses for F. Um, so again, if you disagree with de delegating behaviour support, if you can type in F and then and no, or abstent or F and abstention. Okay, we not get any further votes on that one. So we've got uh, three yeses and one abstention, two abstentions. Three abstentions. There we go, right. six votes. Okay, thank you. And then, so that the primary forum, um, sorry, the contribution to former education services grants, again, all those primary reps, um, I suppose we'll have to use a two for this one because we haven't got a letter. So if you can type in two with yes, no, or abstention for the um, contribution to the former education services grant. Five for two yeses. Okay. So, yep, well, that's everyone. Yeah. The last one's come through. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so now. Um, oh, we can use Simon. Simon, yes. Simon, if you'd like to do the same, so if you'd like to put the letter <laughs> um, and yes, no, or abstention for contingency, the way for contingency. B for special staff costs. C for school improvement and D for behaviour support. And four for um, education services grant. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. That was nice and easy. Um, and then for the uh, special schools, um, if the governor, the head teacher rep and the governor rep for special schools um, would vote for the education again if you put in the let the yeah, five and the uh, right excellent brilliant I love it when it all works yes so do I. are you okay with that if we carry on then yes thank you all right cool that moves on to agenda item eight which is the school balances update which is me <laughs> <laughs> are you ready to talk about that yet yes I've got me notes Okay, cool. Right. Oh, I better, I better show me face, I suppose. Right. So, for those that you don't know me, I'm Sue Ashley. Um, this is a regular report that comes to Schools Forum, um, and it's based on uh, the period six monitoring. Uh, so that's September um, monitoring that we do uh, with schools. Um, and it does tend to be more pessimistic because we work on the basis that budgets are fully spent if they're um, if they if they're not. So we, we do we do tend to they do tend to be a bit more pessimistic. So when we get to period nine, uh, they they do tend to to look a little bit better going forward. Um, there is, um, as Christine's mentioned, there is additional funding um, in the DSG for 22-23 financial year as well as the supplementary funding um, that Christine's already talked about. Um, 
This, however, this will be offset by an additional 1.25% of employers' national insurance uh, costs um, and obviously expected pay awards and, um, and utility increases uh, going forward. Um, the indications... See, look, I can't talk and move this thing at the same time. Um, the the balances at the the end of March were 13.48 million, um, and the um, trend generally is that balances will reduce going forward um, as schools use some of their surplus balances uh, to offset rising costs. Um, just a quick chat about, oh, sorry, about deficit budgets. The, there were 11 schools that ended the financial year with the deficit budget. Um, I don't think um, but working, looking at the projections that the schools provide, that is looking to uh, increase to 21 uh, deficit budget in March 2023 if no action is taken. However, um, the schools work hard and we work hard with the schools to try and ensure that those schools that are moving towards those deficit budgets are, are making decisions that will enable them to, to stay in, in there, with, stay within credit. Um, so although it might, when we get to March 2023, hopefully it won't be that bad, but that's certainly what the projections are looking like at the moment. We have five schools uh, that have a notice of concern. Um, and we have five schools that are having a school management resource assessment uh, through the um, through the DFE, um, and the DFE will provide a, a report at the end of it with support and advice on how those schools can can uh, support their budgets going forward. Uh, the local authority will continue to work with schools to manage their balances and the reports for noting. Any questions? No, brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Fantastic yeah. and succinct as ever. Um, I think it's probably you again with the uh, work plan. Is that correct, Sue? Or is that just for uh... the the work plan? The work plan is just for information. Um, okay. I think I think James has probably got things to add that'll change the uh the the, yeah. the report james you've got a hand up thank you chair so there was a march provisional meeting that we were considering putting in and one of the requests for our members is that we do go ahead in a march discourse forum meeting for two reasons between now and march we're hoping to have another meeting that i need to work in group James. Sorry, James, we can't hear you. Um, just the background noise, I think. Is your mic? Where's your, yeah. Sorry. Mike, apologies, uh, forum members. I'll start that again. So we'd like to request that there is a March meeting of schools forum. Uh, first of all, the first agenda item we'd like to put on there is feedback from the high needs working group. We're hoping to meet again in February and then report back to schools forum as to the oversight of that meeting around the key priorities that were identified before Christmas. In addition, uh, which I was going to pick up in AOB, and I was hoping that someone white would be able to join us, the DCS, to update in relation to the AOB, but unfortunately she's not been able to join us yet. Uh, she may come in. Uh, as an AOB, there is a publication of a piece of guidance that came out from the DFE last Monday. And unfortunately, given the timing of when that was published by the DFE, we could not put it into schools forum to make a decision between then and today's schools forum. And it's in relation to reforming how local authorities improvement functions are funded. It's in relation to the monitoring and brokerage grant that is awarded to the local authority each academic year. Uh, there was consultation that went out before Christmas in October and November, seeking the views. It took place between 29th of October and the 26th of November. They fed back their outcome of that. <clears throat> and their view is that they want to change the way the monitoring and brokerage grant is funded to local authorities in the fact that they're going to remove it. So their intention is that in the next uh, financial year, the local authorities would receive 50% of what they would normally expect in the monitoring and brokerage grant. Uh, and the following year, 23-24, 
there will not be a monitoring and brokerage grant. And I'll read from the conclusions of the uh, consultation that the, the expectation from the DfE is that councils and local authority maintain schools value the early support and challenge which councils provide to maintain schools as part of their call school improvement function. And we will enable councils to deduct funding from maintain school budgets to ensure this can remain the case going forward. Uh, there are a couple of bullet points there around how that process can be done. And we felt that given the timeframes involved in that, that it wouldn't be appropriate to bring a paper today uh, because we, you wouldn't have been able to consult with other head teachers properly for a formal consultation process if there's any changes to de-delegation. So what we recommend is that we come to a provisional uh, meeting in March for Schools Forum to look at a paper in response to this um, decision that the DfE may have made around the monitoring and brokerage grant and then a decision can be made for the following financial year and there's different mechanisms that are open to us. The other reason for wanting to do that in March is there is a view that we're trying to get consistency across the northwest uh, and some on the DCS is meeting with other DCSs from across the Northwest to agree what that de-delegation should look like in response to the DFE's proposals of how that funding can be taken through Schools Forum. And so what we're doing is the same as what they're doing, say, in the city region, local authorities, but hopefully across the whole of the Northwest. So I hope that makes sense. And our intention is to bring that paper to March as to how we can move forward with that alongside feedback of an update from the High Needs Working Group that will meet in February. But happy to take any questions in response to that consultation that's on the DFE website. And Simone passes apologies that she couldn't make the meeting to do that update herself. Okay, thank you, James. Does anybody have any questions to, for James about this process? Uh, I take it that, that there would be more questions once we've seen what it is we're going to discuss uh, and when we get together uh, both in February and uh, March to discuss this particular item. No. Nope. Okay. We, James, can I just can I just confirm that we set the date of the meeting? Yeah, provisionally we set the day as the seventh of March. Seventh of March. Yeah. Okay. So trying to follow the um, trend of doing it on a Tuesday in as early as March as possible. Uh, my intention is to have the report completed a month earlier to give uh, schools and members of forum appropriate time to have that conversation with the areas that they represent and other school leaders and the consultation will go out to forum members but it'll also that that report will go out to all head teachers of maintained schools but happy to take any comments from colleagues around that time frame that the march meeting 7th of march with the intention to get the report out by the 7th of february the 7th of march is a monday by the way Sorry, some apologies, John and John. It is a Monday. Is it? Oh. So it should be the 8th of March. Apologies. <laughs> Correct. I do apologize. The 8th as of well. March. I'm surprised we didn't pick that up yesterday. Okay. Thanks for that correction, John. You're welcome. Um, we're all happy. We'll make a note of that. I'm sure Sue will be sending out, or somebody will be sending out a, uh, an invite for that. And uh, a date for the uh, High Needs Working Group was provisionally tabled as well? Yes, I think we suggested it would be the 15th of February for members of Schools Forum that uh, attend the High Needs Working Group. If that works for everyone, it'd be a four o'clock start on the 15th. Yeah, and, and again, those members who are part of the High Needs Working Group will get an invite. Brilliant. Um, is that all you've got to say about those, that particular item? Yes, unless any other forum members want any clarifications or have any concerns with the timeframes that I've outlined. Um, we were going to mention as well the changes to the uh, finance stroke forum going forward. Yes, the second AOB is in relation to the administration of schools forum. So uh, I'll leave it to the chair to say thank you to the finance colleagues that have supported schools forum for a, a number of years. But moving forward, uh, the next schools forum meeting from a finance perspective, this is Christine Thompson's final meeting uh, from an LA perspective. Uh, Howard Bedwell will be supporting schools forum from a finance perspective from March. 
And in addition, from an organisation perspective, Schools Forum will be supported by our democratic services team. So colleagues are on the call today from our democratic services. They will be picking up that admin and therefore Sue Ashley will still attend Schools Forum, but only specifically for the reports that she brings to Schools Forum, like the uh, schools budget report. So moving forward, there will just be a slight change in organisation and finance representation. So from my perspective, a massive thank you, but I'll leave it to yourself as the chair to say uh, a thank you as well and for behalf of Schools Forum. I'm sure everybody else would join me in saying thank you to uh, Christine and to Sue for their contributions uh, and we look forward to seeing Sue in a more passive role uh, going forward um, where she can escape from the uh, the awful post of uh, having to deal with all these voting uh, complications which she has done exceptionally well over the years. So uh, thank you very much for your contributions uh, and your reports and your attendance. And we look forward to those people trying to fill those shoes, doing an equally good job. And I think, if I'm right in saying, I'll give everybody a chance to say thank you to those uh, members. Um, and we look forward to seeing those uh, people who are in the, these posts uh, joining us in a lead role going forward. And, and we look forward to working with them. Is there there's no more questions and everybody's saying thank you. We will call this meeting to a close and uh, we will see you again in some of you in February, uh, the rest in March. Thanks, John. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, James. We all done. Thanks, John. I normally send the minutes out to Adrian and James just for double checking. So you will have the pleasure of that this time. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> OK, right, thanks brilliant. very much. Thanks. Yes, sir. thanks. Bye. Yeah. Warm hugs and all the rest of it. Thank you. Thanks. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. bye.